saw you last in this place on Wednesday night. Uh, but night, tonight, let's uh, turn, if you would, you have your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 3, and also you found your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to just read uh, verse 13 and 14 of Ephesians chapter 3, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Wherefore I desire that ye think not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and, and now for this privilege and opportunity to stand here in your presence and in the midst of these people. And we have our Bibles open uh, and our minds are prepared to be receptive, our hearts are ready to receive the engrafted Word of God. We pray that you would open the Scriptures to us, that when we leave here, that we will be burdened with your will, that we go out uh, knowing that we have work to do in the kingdom and that work will be done by your spirit as we obey Christ. So we ask now that you fill us with your spirit, with wisdom and knowledge, strength and courage, that you would grant us the, this awesome privilege of being able to do it easily in Christ Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. Our last week we looked at do not faint. Do not faint. And I believe that part of the prescription for that is to, it will involve suffering, unfortunately. Uh, but then again, I should say, fortunately for us, because that's one of our identification marks with Jesus Christ. So it's suffering 
unto being thankful. Right? Those two don't tend to go together, but we're we're talking about the kingdom of God. So it's suffering to the degree of thanksgiving. If you recall when Peter and the other disciples, along with those in the church when they were persecuted, uh, they thanked God that they had been persecuted for Jesus Christ's sake. So it's suffering unto thanksgiving. And this isn't suffering for the things that we've done or the things that we've failed to do, but this is uh, suffering primarily uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's praying without ceasing to the degree that we are hopeful, meaning that we're not just hoping that things will happen, but no, the things that God has said in his word that will come to pass, that they will come to pass. And what we're doing, we're just praying God's will uh, be done. So once again here in verse uh, 13, uh, it reads, Wherefore I desire and notice the uh, intensity of the apostles' prayer. It's not for himself. It's not for any material blessing, but he's praying for these believers. And his prayer is that they do not faint, that they do not lose heart uh, at his tribulations, Paul's tribulations. In this word, tribulations, it, it really means pressure. Pressure. Uh, as Christ said in Luke 12, that whosoever has been given much, much is required. And the Apostle Paul had received great revelation uh, to the degree that the Apostle Peter was awed by the fact that the Apostle Paul had received such knowledge to give to the church. But he said that what was given to him was the word of God to the church. So it, it carries with it pressure, uh, being afflicted, having anguish of spirit, because you're in a situation that you cannot do anything about because in Paul's case, this was his calling. He was called to suffer with Christ and to suffer for Christ. Then the church will be the beneficiaries of it because they, along with us, we have the fruit on our laps, the word of God that came through him. So it's also trouble it would be being persecuted. Now, I'm sure that the Apostle Paul's feelings when he was going through these sufferings, that he was happy about it. But I believe that his spirit, Paul, in his new creation, understood that it was worth it. And therefore, he endured it. But he did not want these saints to lose heart because of what they had heard about him suffering for Jesus Christ. And the same is true today, is that the sufferings of Christ, more so than the Apostle Paul, we appreciate those things he did, that we don't lose heart, that we become... Uh, we draw back, we shrink, rather than press forward, uh, being led by the Spirit of God to do uh, the will of God. So if you just hold your place there, let's go over to, you there, I need to get there, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4.
And I hadn't planned on starting at verse 1, but uh, it's a good place to start because we find this same word, which means to lose heart, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And beloved, you may say, I don't know. Uh, we've been talking a whole lot about losing heart and drawing back. Uh, do you know something we don't know? Well, the calendar, according to God's prophetic record, uh, the worst of times are yet ahead of us. The persecution that has made its way uh, in some parts and continuing to grow as the world now is almost one language. Uh, persecution is growing. So we need to know that as the persecution increases, that we do not lose heart, that we won't draw back, that we will be who God created us to be and allow the Spirit of God to use us through our uniqueness. So he's saying, and really I believe that the apostles and these leaders are also in view here. So what do you do, and to the group that this was written to, what do you do when you, okay, we can't lose heart. We, we have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, when you think about losing heart, let's consider verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, that we live as we are living in the sight of God, but we we have a an awareness of that. Now, of a surety, God is in this place. I have no doubt about it. We will need him. I will need him to get through this session. You will need him to uh, help process by the Spirit what is being said. We are all going to need him to grant us the strength as he allowed us to come in here to depart and to go to our several homes. Well, we can't lose the awareness factor that God is here. And this is something that the Apostle Paul, and I believe that the early church majored in, is that not only did they know that God was with them, they were also expecting Christ to come back. So if you're expecting Christ to come back and you know that God is with you, you know, you, you, can, you can get down to business with living for the Lord. Here in verse 3, he says, but if our gospel be hid. Now, if our gospel is hid, it doesn't have anything to do with anything in verse 2. In other words, when people see me, Will they be turned off before I open my mouth to go to broadcasting? Because when we teach the word of God, we preach the gospel, it's broadcasting. We're sowing seed. But will people, because they know me or they have known me or they think they know me, I want to make sure that there isn't anything that would be between the audience that needs the gospel that they will listen, and then the church that needs the children's bread to be fed so that we can live for God. But the context goes now into, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of a glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, 
should shine unto them. Now, the gospel is hid, unfortunately. But it is only hid to those who are lost. We know that the gospel was the message that was responsible for saving us. It was the message that was delivered that reached the very core of our being. This gospel, with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, grasped our attention like no other message that we had heard convicted us to the degree that we threw up our arms and we threw in the towel to say, I am undone. I am, you know, I am a sinner and I need a savior. It was the gospel. And it is the message, the only message, that will raise the dead spiritually. This was the message that not only caused an alarm to go off in that part of us that Christ said, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, to go off in our spirit to say that I'm not who I have been believing that I am. Even the press in the world is all wrong. I am corrupt to the core. I'm no good for nothing. So it is those in whom this message is hid. But, Thanks be to God. The message is a message of light. In spite of the darkness. Verse 4 deals with the God of this world. But lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. We don't preach ourselves. We do not preach others. Uh, we don't preach Men, we do not preach well-known men in the faith. We preach Christ, Jesus, and him crucified. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And this is where we get back to the Apostle Paul here in verse number 8, where it says in chapter 4, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now notice, the Apostle Paul is referencing himself as suffering. So if he's going to be telling these Ephesian believers that don't lose heart. He's not going to tell them anything that he has not experienced going through the sufferings where he can do it and when he says it, people will believe him. It's easy to hear about something and repeat it. But when you've gone through something and that's been your experience, can't no one tell it like you that hasn't been through it. So the Apostle Paul here is just making it known. We're troubled on every side. And you got to picture this. On every side. He's hemmed in. It, it doesn't matter what they do. They're calling. They could no more escape from this than Christ could. And he didn't want to from going to the cross for us. And he's teaching us by the Spirit. That when we sense this, and I know the pressure of living in this world with all of the things that are happening, but a lot of the things that are happening in our lives have nothing to do with Christ. And we attribute those things to Christ. I'm going through something when maybe what you're going through is because of something that's really earmarked. For me, I'm dealing with this because I failed to do what I was supposed to do. Amen. So, but the Apostle Paul wants the believers to understand that when you're going through and you're living godly and holiness is your aim and pleasing God, 
You just want to be in the center of God's will that when these things happen, you're not going to be able to escape it. You, you're going to have to walk in it. You're going to have to wear it. And I believe that as we do so, the joy of the Lord will help us to get through it. People will want you to complain and bellyache like they are about things in the world. And when you're dealing with things in the world and also things that are associated with the kingdom because of the sufferings of Christ. Don't let anyone make following Christ arduous. In other words, hard, difficult. Because it, it is to those who are not saved. It is to the, the average church child because they're not saved. They don't have the spirit of God to be able to do what God has for us to do. So we can expect this, not what the apostles went through. See, when we read this and then we look at that, that's my life right there. That's, I'm, Paul, you talking about, no, Paul is not talking about us. No one in this room has gone through what the Apostle Paul went through and the others. And they knew that they were worthy of death because they were Christ. They understood that. And they knew that time was of the essence. They didn't have, they didn't have time for the world. They had to use their time wisely. Rest when they could. Eat when they could get something. Wear what they had. Verse 8 is just so full. We are troubled on every side, yet not depressed or distressed. Well, in here, it, well, it is distressed. And we are perplexed, but not in despair. Oh, me, look at me. Lord, do you care? Do you care about me? The true child of God knows that he cares. He's demonstrated that. And he's continuing to do it. Bit by bit, little by little, as we go forth. It's amazing. People would rather hear us complain than to say something positive. Even if it has nothing to do with something, and, and mostly everything has something to do with God one way or another except evil. But they were rough. What do you think about this? And it's something that they know that the, the answer is not going to be favorable. I had that to happen just before I left work. And I would just say, you know, it's, it's challenging. <laughs> it's been a challenge. And then the other guy said, a struggle. I said, well, I, yeah, a struggle. But not to get down in the mud and start slinging it with everyone else. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now, listen, at some point, the Apostle Paul expected this. Now, Christ told him it was going to happen before it did, but when it started happening, and then it happened again, now Paul said, now I'm beginning to expect this. Now, this is going to be my routine. I'm going to be suffering for Jesus Christ. That's going to be my resurrection. When I leave here, when I die, my resurrection, you know, is going to be associated with suffering for Christ. It's manifested in his body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Now, this goes back over, even though it's to the Corinthians, this goes back to the church, to the saints. Is that what they are going through as the foundational uh, apostolic ministry in the church, Christ is giving us our teachings through these men to the church. They, like I said, they, they're the closest to the, to the earth, the foundation, as we, we said last week. The, the, the foundation is that part that sits on the ground. And I believe that's how the Apostle Paul said we're pretty much the offspring of the earth. They, they could identify with just being, Paul was knocked down and dragged out on the ground. They expected this. But it was for us. It was for those who would come and have an opportunity like myself and pastor and others 
to build on what has been built, but to be a wise builder. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Back over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And here finally, here in verse 14. For this cause I, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of Jesus Christ. This is where we begin the, the family language that we'll see in the next verse. That we are in the family of God. I don't know if, of course, none of us had the opportunity to choose our parents, where we would be born, where we would live, you know, early on. But here in our text here, because of our relationship in union to Christ, Christ is our Savior and our Lord, but, but we are also in the family of faith in Him. We are in God's family in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the thing that makes Christ and who He is and what He did for us so magnificent and so profound is that He would take us out of the first man's family of the earth and put us in the second man, the Lord of heaven. Out of the first Adam into himself, the last Adam. Bringing us into God the Father. Never to be, as it was said in here Sunday, never to ever to be orphans again. We are his. He belongs to us. We are his children. We are his people. You have to know that if we're in God's family, the question is, who died? So who died so that could happen? Well, the question is better, who died and was raised from the dead and has ascended back to his own father? The question that some raise and Pastor Trey dealt with it some Sunday is, you people, you, you can lose your salvation. You have to, you have to really, I, I'm, more, I'm more concerned with those who've never been saved than those who are going to lose their salvation. Because who's going to lose their salvation? You, you, you're already sitting in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is in us and representative of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So Paul, when he said absent from the body, present with the Lord, he was present with the Lord down here, but not like it will be up there. So we already are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. What is Christ going to say? Oh, you, you, you sat down a little while positionally in me. Now you have to go. Maybe that happened to you and your family. Maybe they told you you had to leave. Maybe they don't, some don't own you. But God is not going to turn us away. Why? Because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is as for as much as God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, we are one with Christ. How can Christ be divided from those who are his own? When, when that day happens, Christ can no longer say that my Father and I, we are one. 
This has nothing to do with us being deity. This has everything to do with the power of God's word. I'm more concerned with those who've never been saved than those who have maybe appeared to be saved. I'm more concerned with those who have yet to hear the name Jesus Christ than those whom we're concerned about where well, they may lose their salvation. I'm more concerned with those who never had salvation. Those who will leave us and go back into the world and live and do things they never thought they would do. They never had salvation. You know, it's amazing how people come up with scenarios when, when God gives them something easy to do by the Spirit, they say, well, we're not going to do that, and they, they got all these reasons, and sometimes it's legitimate. But we'll come up with a reason why, well, this person right here is going to lose their salvation. I'm not, I'm not concerned with that. Why should I be concerned with somebody losing something that they did not had nothing to do with receiving except for obeying the gospel. Here in verse 14, he's talking about bowing his knee unto the Father. Notice who appears first here. Unto the Father. See, the Apostle Paul, it's like he was with Peter and James and John and the rest of the fellows because this is how Christ taught them to pray. Not so much about the bowing of the knee, but we get why he's bowing his knee because of, this is the Apostle Paul. And Paul, the Apostle Paul said, I'm insignificant. I'm, I'm small change. I'm no one. But what was given to him means and should mean everything to you and I. Is that God is our Father because He's the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't spend enough time basking in that revelation that that God is my Father. And that the Lord Jesus Christ, that yeah, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, he, he's my everything. And this relationship was on his behalf. Because you have to think about it. If man was going to sin and he did, which among the Godhead would go and look for them? Track them down. Literally hunt them down. Which one would it be? Would it be the Father? He'd be involved. Would it be the Spirit? He would not be left out. It would be the one who created them. He created all of us. Jesus Christ. That's why we cannot pay him enough honor and respect. We cannot pay him enough homage. We cannot worship him enough. And we can worship Christ. And I know when we are praying, there are times when we, we start talking to the Father. And next thing you know, we're, we're talking to the Lord. And, and, I, and I believe that's all right. I don't think it's anything wrong with that. But the Apostle Paul is saying that I'm, I'm bowing my knee. And see, once again, verse 13 is pivotal. Verse 1 it's where he started this thought of praying, but look at what he, he gave us. He, he, he unburdened himself and, and he laid it upon the church. Not a burden that we would be burdened down, but a burden of, I love it, a burden of light. Christ said, my burden is that of light. What is it? The word is glorious. It's light. It's a message of light. Light represents what? Truth. Error. Represents darkness. Lies. Represent falsehoods. Should I bow my knees? You have to picture the old apostle. I guess at this time. Don't know how old he was. But he's just going to go down on his, on his knees. 
before his heavenly father in the presence of the Lord Jesus and in the presence of the eternal spirit. Verse 15, and he's talking about still the father of whom the, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I said this rather weakly a few weeks ago that perhaps this is only speaking of the church. You know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't dogmatic about it, but I believe this is his family because in Job, he has the, the sons of God. It could be many, a host of individuals that all have Jesus Christ to whom they worship and adore because he's the one who created them. For the Son of God created everyone and everything. Remember in Christ, that he would gather all in one. We looked at that verse back in chapter 1. I believe it was verse 10. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And the family that's in the earth know who they are. Know that they're in the family. Not wondering if they are in the family. They know they are. It didn't take you long to figure out. Once you became of age and you would go to sleep in the same house and eat at the same table, sleep in the you know, same bed, go to school from the same house, that, that's where, that was your home. That was your family. And as you were able to take in knowledge and understanding, you begin to find out who your, who your people are. And you know something? Those same people that were your people then, they be your people now. I mean, by blood they are, right? In many, in many cases, by relationships, I know some of them have passed off the scene, but they were, your, they were your people. Well, God has a family. And he is getting that family together. I know it don't look like it, but he is. The gospel is going forth, and you have Jew and Gentile coming to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the church is being added to, and just like tonight, the church is being built up. Now, if you leave here with your head between your legs, talking about how, Lord, how in the world I'm going to be able to do what you're requiring of me, if you lose heart, it's going to be your fault. It's not going to be my fault. There's something ahead for you to do. And listen, you may think about losing heart, but go check your list out. Make sure that those things that you have renounced or those things that you said, I disown those things in chapter 2, of uh, 2 Corinthians 4. I disown those things, but I'm going to live holy. I'm going to live a holy and a sanctified life. I'm not going to lose heart, but I'm going to face whatever it is that's coming my way. Because you have someone counting on you. There's someone that needs you to, to be who God created you to be in their life, in the ministry, in which is shut up within you. So you have a whole, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I just have to believe that that name that's on them is the name of the Son of God. I believe that's the name that's on all of creation that's within God's family. Wait until we see the family. Wait until we see the, the Old Testament saints. Those who were on the earth when Christ was on the earth, part of the remnant. Wait until we see those who are going to be saved after when Christ comes back and, and, and you have Jews and Gentiles being saved. Wait until we meet the family. Verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the Spirit. We're talking about losing heart. 
We're talking about receiving what the Spirit of God has given the Apostle Paul. And Paul said, listen, I've given it to you. You have to read it aloud. And, and he didn't say it that way, but that's what we gathered from the previous chapter. It needs to be read and it needs to be taught. So, remember, we took you back over to Joshua to see, listen, you have to be strong. But it's not just trying to convince yourself that I'm strong. Is that he's praying a prayer that they would be strengthened. It would not be their own strength. They would have to depend on the strength of the new creation. Or just the resolve of saying, we're going to do this for God. Well, that's good. That's a, that's a positive attitude. But you need to be strengthened by the Spirit of God in your inner man. In down in who you really are. The man that comes forth when we walk in obedience. It's the man that people depend on in your home. The woman that people look forward to in your home, on the job. It's the one they can count on. It's the inner man that comes forth. Now, we don't have a, a moment like Christ had when he was up in the Mount of Transfiguration where that's going to be light and all of that because <laughs> the light came out of him and he, that was his glory. That's because he's God. But when we live from the inside out, from out of our inner man, we are walking in obedience. People will want to be around us. Matter of fact, when we get ready to leave, they'll wonder, can't you just stay around a little bit longer because we're having such a wonderful time here. I'm learning so much. Or your company, I mean, you, your company is just worth us being in this place. But then there are times when we don't always do that. We'll come out with the old man. He tired. He run down. He hungry. You know, he, 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 always, got, he always got an issue. He, uh, no matter how well things are going, the, the old man, the, the, the old flesh will say, well, I doubt that. <laughs> it ain't that good. I haven't eaten supper yet. You know, I'm hungry. And I, I, I believe I don't get anything. I'm going to die because I'm famished. And I look around. I don't mean a bit of harm, but I'm not looking on any of you. I can just look at myself. I took my coat off tonight, and I start not to do it because, you know, I said, my goodness. But if you just go out and you look around on people, people, we are eating. I told my wife about it. I said, just look at us. We are out of shape. We are big, and, and we, we just, we don't, we don't eat right. We, we, we just, we do what we want to do. It shows up on the outside as to how we're living, really, Privately. It does. Just do it. I mean, just when you go to the store, just look around and see. How, it's very seldom you see a small individual. Because we can't tell ourselves no. Because if you tell Dennis no, he'll make you pay. <laughs> you tell him no. I'm telling you. Tell him no. But he won't feel like wanting to do nothing. He ain't going to feel like getting up. When I was first saved, I, I would tell folk, I said, yeah, I said, it's amazing how, and I was just beginning to learn about, you know, Dennis, that old poor critter, you know, even, you know, good, you won't know good for nothing, but the flesh, you know, the different, different, different subject, but I just remember Dennis comparing him to just being saved and, and, and saying, well, this is my flesh. You know, if the long clock went off, he, he could slap at it and knock it in the floor. He didn't care about it. But, but the new creation said, man, are you kidding me? We got to get up here, boy. We, we got to go to work. We got obligations. We, people are going to be waiting on us. We got a job to do. You know, we've got to execute today. We got to do the best job possible so that we can get paid at the end of the week. And the old Dennis didn't want no part of that. I know I'm going to lay here. I'm going to just lay here. I don't feel like it. Don't feel like it. And finally, once you get that old critter up, then you got to take him in there and you got to clean him up. You got to brush him up. Uh, 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 stop. I want a donut. See, you can't get him up, but then once you get him up, he wants to do what? He want to drive. He want to take over. That's how it works. Now, I'm sure that y'all don't have that kind of problem. Yeah. But that's a, I, I, I have to talk to myself. There's a Burger King on my way home. And I, I said, no. I, I'm not, no, you cannot have a burger. We're going home. 
He said, that's crazy. I'll be honest with you. You're probably crazy if you don't talk to yourself. I mean that with yes. Now, but, but notice this, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might by his spirit. This is the same spirit who was there in creation who brooded, hovered over the earth. Everything that was in that example, he was there before light came forth. But just in creation proper, he was there. He's the one who, when Christ spoke, things came into existence, but by the power of the spirit. Not by might. Not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. It is the spirit of God who enables us to do what we don't feel like doing for Christ. Watch this. And for others. Down where we need the strength. How many of you, you situation where you didn't, whatever it was you didn't want to do until you started doing it. You were like the, one of the sons who said, I'm going in, to the field and didn't go. And the other son said, I'm not going. Then he went. But when you started doing it, it's like, man, when you got into it, you, it's almost like you were going to run past the finish line. I, I can remember my wife, she, you know, she, she's kind of big on projects. And I'm kind of big on putting them off. And uh, so, but I've always noticed that once we get into that thing, man, we get to working together, and and and, and it, it's always it's always better than I imagined. So much so, I say, I'm so, I'm, 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 honey, I'm sorry I put that off like that because we make a good team working together. Same thing is true when we're going to do what it is that the Lord has told us to do. You need to be strengthened. In your inner man. But beloved. If you're not saved. You, you can't be strengthened. Because you don't have the spirit. And this is a prayer that's answered. And this is a prayer that we can pray. For strength. I, I have to ask the Lord to. Strengthen me. Grant me the courage. And the wherewithal. To, to stay with the strip. To do exactly what he would have me to do. And there has never been a time where he's left me alone. Now there had been a time uh, uh, and time after time where I was inadequate because I failed to prepare. This is a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for these believers. We can pray this prayer for this church, our the saints here, other saints. Because even in this area right here, there are other believers and there are folk who are lost. And then you have the church that needs to be built up. Is to pray for saints that are around us. That was verse 16. Listen to this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, it's being in Christ and faith in the Lord Jesus and loving the saints. Cannot compensate for losing heart. In other words, he said, I'm in Christ and that's a reality. I'm loving the saints and that's happening. But when we lose heart because of the sufferings of Christ that he experienced, let's just talk about the sufferings of those where someone else, you know, this happened to those missionaries. You know, this right here happened to you know, some believers. Faith in the Lord Jesus and loving the saints is not enough 
to prevent us from losing. We must be strengthened by the Spirit. You, you want to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And that's more than words. It is the Spirit granting us so that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Because we don't ever lose sight of the fact that Christ is in us. He's with us by faith. We don't ever lose sight of that. Uh, but when we do, bad things happen. Consequences come and repercussions. Whenever we lose sight of the fact that Christ is in us by faith, if we choose not to, plug our ears, won't hear what the Spirit is saying, and He doesn't speak loud. It don't take much to grind Him out. Bad things always happen. They do to me. Y'all don't have to testify. I'll go on and do it since I'm up. Bad things happen. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You know, when you think about Christ in your heart by faith, it's because Christ is in us by Spirit. Christ is not everywhere dwelling. He's at home, away from home. Not the temple as it was in Jerusalem. He's at home in his own. Remember what we said? He said God wanted to be with his people so much so that he would be with him in the wilderness in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Be with him in the tabernacle. Be with them in the, in the temple where they could come and hear the word. But what he really wanted before he brings us into his present is to be in us. He wanted what the benefit of marriage provides. Oneness. Where my people know I'm with them because, not because I'm just with the caravan, I'm with them down in their spirit. That's where he abides so gently. And see, as we're strengthened in our inner man, the, you, you don't, you're very sensitive to, to Christ's presence. You're sensitive. You know what he like. You know what he don't like. And I'm using that in a very kind of loose term because it, with him is what he loves and what he hates. So you, you, you don't want to put him in, it, in front of something that he hates. You want to put him somewhere where oh, he, he loves this. This activity right here, oh, he loves it, but, but he hates that. It's because the inner man and Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith, we practice his presence. Few moments will be done. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. That. This is where people think all of a sudden you be sudden you become easy. And you can't see no wrong in no one. 
And somehow you can see the good in everything. But the more you sense the reality of the presence of the Lord, you always see the little dot on the sheet of paper. You see the rest of the paper that has nothing on it. You, you don't go looking and sniffing for problems. You don't try to analyze every situation to say, this is how it happened, and you know, all the way. Rather than just saying, well, let's just look at this thing. Is everyone okay? Is there anyone that needs to be saved in this situation? See, when you're being strengthened in your inner man, you're concerned with what, who and what God is concerned with. Because, see, God still loved the world. That demonstration was when he gave his son, but he's still loving the world. He still doesn't want them to perish. He still wants the church to grow and to grow up in their most holy faith. So, a good measuring indicator is, how is this love thing working out? I mean, people that hate you, oh, you still, but I love them. And then, yeah, it's that part of us that we have to deal with and say, I know what you think. I know what they did. I know what we believe. And let me just say this too. You know, you know how many times you've been wrong about someone? You thought that they were like this, only to find out that they are nothing like what you imagine. I'll never forget a guy came and showed up on the job and I kind of figured because he knew this guy, they had been talking about me, and, and he looked at me kind of hard, but he was kind of big, austere looking guy anyhow. And, but when I got in his presence, and our first interacting, action together, we hit it off, and we kept going. You know, sometimes we, we read people wrong, and that goes back to being grounded in love, that we see things through a prism of love. Now, listen, we don't go around just saying, it went wrong, oh, that's, oh, that, that's not wrong. No, it's love where we love the people. We, we love people who hate God. We love those who will never be saved, but we love them because God's going to love them all the way to the end. I think this would probably be a good place to knock off. But how is that working out for you when it comes to love? I know with me, sometimes I, I don't feel very strong in the inner man and, and it shows up with how I talk, what I do. For what I won't do. How I will avoid. For when I sense the, not only the presence of the Lord, but I know that prayer that the apostle has said here before us, that I'm strengthened in the inner man. I want to go ahead. I want to go straight to that person, to those individuals. And you want to know something? In those moments. Is when the Lord's will is carried out. So when I don't obey, I think that's almost like the equivalent of, of losing heart because there is an element of losing heart that calls you, it has a bad connotation to go back to being who we used to be. Remember when you were in the world, you, you had a pattern. If a person said this about you, you did this. If they did this to you, you did that. Losing heart can cause us to turn and go back. And go back into being who we used to be from memory. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are we're so grateful to you that as we have come tonight and looked at not losing heart. 
this message is going to come in, I believe, sooner than later as we see suffering around us along with the calamity that's happening in our land and the world because we're, we're in the end and Christ, his return is, is, is soon to come. We don't want to come behind. We don't want to be left out. That when you set us on an assignment, you have us to go into enemy territory. That we will not make all of the excuses that we've made in the past. That we will go fortified in the faith, but strengthened in our inner man. That when we come into that environment, that those in whom we are to reach by just getting there so that you can reach them from that point, they will sense love. Love that we talk about that goes from heart to heart and from breast to breast. Love that it's almost tangible. It's almost contagious when it's exhibited. Father, I pray that you, by your spirit, remind us to pray at least this prayer in its entirety. And what we work tonight, just to ask the spirit of God to strengthen us, to go back into that situation, knowing that your will will be done, even if it doesn't look like it. We thank you. We praise you. I thank you for these precious souls who are here with us and for those who are watching by means of social media. So we ask the blessing over each of them in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.